Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, from wherever you're dialing from. I'm happy to be here today to uh, be speaking to you about uh, a very interesting topic. Uh, working as an Agile coach over the years uh, for me has been uh, very exciting. And uh, I've also learned uh, a whole lot of, a lot, whole lot of things uh, over the years as well. And um, I thought to just share a few of those things with you. I'm going to share my screen really quick right now so that you can all view my screen. And my topic, I'm gonna put it in presentation mode. And so how do we go from products to, uh, from projects to products in three steps? Uh, this is an agile strategy that I find that works also, uh, it's a really big question that I do get asked as an Agile coach anytime I'm working on an engagement with a client who has started its Agile journey. And uh, this is always very, very interesting because when you're teaching Agile and you're talking about DevOps and different Agile practices, you're referring to product development, your product, and you know all those type of things. And um, I find out that a lot of people really and quickly want to move away from projects, you know, which has a start and an end. And so uh, over the years, I've been able to really get excited about helping people move from that project mindset to product. Um, a little bit about me. So my name is um, Abiyojin Osoba. I always go by Abby. So uh, you can refer to me as Abby, A-B-B-Y. And uh, my title I also go by and I call myself an international business agility coach and trainer. And that's simply because I've worked in so many geographical regions. I've worked in North America, I've worked in Middle East and uh, most recently Africa. So I'm speaking to you from Lagos, Nigeria. And I, I'm Nigerian, uh, born and uh, schooled in Nigeria. And then I left Nigeria, I was in Canada for uh, almost 20 years, and that's where I started my whole career life, my agile journey, most especially. Uh, I've worked in different industries, uh, different domains. I've worked in pharmaceutical, agriculture, legal, education, nonprofit, entertainment, telecommunications, banking, insurance. The list is long. And I started uh, my year days. I was a business analyst. I moved into a project management role. I was a program manager. Then I became a, a scrum master. And since then, I've been an Agile coach, been an Agile coach for over 10 years now. Uh, my last role before I left Canada was an enterprise Agile coach for CIBC, which is uh, a really large bank in Canada. Uh, fast forward, I've been in Nigeria now for four years, uh, doing the same thing, working with different organizations. And so you can imagine my experience and all the different stories I have to share with you. There are three steps, as I mentioned before. Um, the first step is identify your products. The second step is create persistent and consistent Agile teams. And of course, the last step is aligned with both finance and portfolio management for value delivery reporting. I'll just tell you a quick story. And so a few years back, I, uh, I've always heard about the Phoenix project. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that as well. And I took a class as a certified trainer and I met a lot of wonderful people from across the world, and I learned a lot. Um, this uh, finished project that I'm talking about was developed into a simulation to help organizations um, improve pain areas, you know, improve delivery, improve uh, shareholder um, um, engagements, and so many different aspects. Really, um, it's called the DevOps of business, and it's to help individuals within an organization to really understand that they need to move away from silo way of working and really help each other focus on the different areas where they need to derive value from. And so this DevOps of business simulation was very exciting. It's, it's a simulation, it's like a game, it runs for eight hours and every two hours, you know, there's some activities and you're scoring and there are different roles, about 13 of them starting from the CEO of the organization up until the tester role. And so you have your finance, your HR and all of that. And basically the whole idea is to really determine 
what type of products you have to build. So it's the beginning of the new fiscal year and you're trying to determine what kind of products, you know, what should we focus on? What should our goal be? And basically this whole DevOps of business helps an organization right from the top uh, executive level decision-making to the tail to really, really understand that there are different products that the organization needs to focus on. The first would be um, products that would help increase our shareholder engagement in the market space. The second is products that would enhance um, employee engagement. So these are internal products that would help, you know, have a better experience for our employees. And the last will be products for our users and our customers. But how does an organization make a decision between what they need to focus on maybe each quarter or each year, uh, each physical year or each quarter? And so this whole simulation really helps you do that. And so if you if you've ever read the book before or you haven't, you know, I want you to do, you know, uh, I share some information after this that, you, that would allow you to really, really understand what I'm describing. But let's fast forward and say that uh, this particular organization, which I'm going to be using as, a, as an example, have decided that we want to focus on two types of products for this quarter. And the first one is products that help to increase employee engagement. And the second is uh, products that would uh, we need to improve for our users and our customers. And so that's the high level, right? And so different units will focus on what they need to focus on. But then the question is, uh, this roadmap doesn't still help you identify your products. You still need to do three things, identify your products. The second thing is create persistent and consistent agile teams. And the third thing is align with both finance and portfolio management for value delivery reporting. And so a friend of mine, a very big bank here in Nigeria, Access Bank, he's, he's saying that the big trend in the Agile community, as I mentioned when I started, is that a lot of people are always talking about how do we move? They're asking that question. They're having conversations, their webinars and Zoom meetings everywhere. People are talking about moving from products, from projects to products. And so organizations sees all the work and creation and the modification of this product there's a, there's a particular way each organization views this. And they always, the, the, the next question is, so how do we fund uh, products, you know, product development end to end? How do we do that? If it's short term, if it's long term, what do we need to do? And so those are uh, the buzz, the conversations and the trends that are happening in the agile community. And I know that's happening all across the world. And so the first step without beating about the bush is I know it's very, it sounds very easy, but um, usually it's not. And a lot of people struggle with deciding what is the product. You know, um, I, I won't uh, uh, move into that conversation, but usually in a classroom or in a coaching session, when I'm working with uh, different groups of people, I even uh, digress a little bit and extend the conversation further to help people understand who a user and a customer is. And usually there are lots of responses. And especially within a bank, you know, when you ask the same question, who is a user and a customer, it's really, really confusing. Depending on the environment, depending on the industry, uh, there's a huge struggle about identifying who a user and a, and, and a customer is. But that's not the conversation for today. Um, if you follow me into Wello after this session, and you want to have those conversations, I'll be happy to, to do that with you. And so um, helping uh, an organization really focus on deciding what the product means, you know, if it's external or if it's internal, you know, uh, one of the things that usually happens is trying to understand the flow of products, you know, that are developed internally and the flow of product that, that goes, that is to go out to the user and to the customers externally. And so um, a lot of times the customer is removed from uh, the, uh, many clients are removed from the external facing product. And so people think that, okay, if we don't, uh, if we talk to the people internally in developing this product, we don't need to focus on the external customer. We will arrive at the, at the, at the final answer that we, we want to. But a lot of times this is a huge mistake that a lot of people have made. And so the idea of moving from projects to products 
has only stayed within an organization internally. It hasn't gone beyond the local level of the organization externally. And so if you can just uh, stay with me while I level set this, imagine the scope of transformation is only step three. Remember what step three is? This is step three. Align with both finance and portfolio management for delivery, for value delivery reporting. So imagine that for a second, that step three is, uh, um, um, that scope of transformation is only for step three, and that is the focus for value stream. Any optimization room that would need to happen would only focus on improving step three. And so if step three is not the bottleneck in the flow of, uh, of value, you're unlikely to make a significant difference overall. But if the bottleneck is in a previous step, step three may already be starving the work. So if the bottleneck is after step three, optimizing step three would only further overwhelm those steps. So improving step three would make it worse. Stay with me. I know that um, a lot of organizations are always focusing when they, when they start having the conversation, how do we move from projects to products? The next conversation is um, funding. And so um, let's assume that uh, funding, the whole conversation about funding is step three, right? How will this investment yield tangible results? Is it worth utilizing and optimizing only step three? Should we focus all our attention on just step three? Because we believe that that's where the you know, highest tangible results will come from. Yeah, you don't have to answer that. And so here are my thoughts. It's likely that no, one's knows, no one knows where the bottleneck is. So imagine if step three was software development, for example. Is it possible that development is the bottleneck in value delivery? Since people are working on step three and asking for help, they already believe that change will help value delivery. They're probably right, even without supporting data. In parallel, improving step three, you must also take a systems view and also look at the steps to begin understanding impediments to value flow. Flow of value is key here. And so if step three, is the bottleneck, you've optimized both the step and the entire value stream. So if step three isn't the bottleneck, then we've optimized this step and we're able to prove that value flow is better. The evidence can be used to convince the other step owners to follow a similar optimization, starting with the step that has the actual bottleneck. And so there, there's actually an activity in really understanding the actual bottleneck. So it's best to address all steps. And so if your scope is improve only one step in the value chain, you must improve that step and also take a systems view. Only then can you expand the transformation on all other steps that might need the help. So you need both the type of products for those of the actual users and the products of step three and how those products support the true products. Now, let me take this deeper. So imagine you're approving HR, right, of the organization. So this falls under the category of improving a product to increase employee engagement, for example. And so one internal product in HR might be talent acquisition. So maybe they're trying to develop uh, an application that would help to deliver, you know, manage this process, right? And so it's uh, uh, in this same, uh, scenario, let's assume talent acquisition is the biggest bottleneck for overall product flow. Maybe it's not, but if the users of HR feel that it's a bottleneck, then it's what's improving, you know. At this point, it's based on how, what people think, but then until they're proving wrong, right, it makes sense. So how to identify all the products? One client already had an Excel, uh, an Excel spreadsheet with their products. This, had, this was like a wonderful head start. You know, a lot of organizations who don't want to invest in tools, they would have uh, Excel going for them, build macros and crazy stuff. And um, so um, they have a lot of inconsistency going on with the Excel sheet. And then development used a set of ideas for products. 
And then another manager comes from another unit and has a different list and operations and it goes on and on. And you have a huge humongous monster and there are tabs and this before you know it, it's a snowball effect happening with this Excel sheet. And everyone sees a different answer, improving product flow becomes difficult. You know, there isn't any synergy that's going on. And so some may feel that you have only one product, for example, and uh, this really holds, but a lot of times people are focusing on multiple products at the same time. And so uh, at the other extreme, some clients have thousands of products and struggle with how to model them. And so there are two quick strategies here. Uh, you focus only on the subset that the organization is act uh, actively working on. Remember my story about the DevOps simulation, the DevOps business? That if you, if you, if your organization, for example, uh, took advantage of that, you will be able to uh, help to organize your products in three categories: the ones that have improved shareholder value or, or um, uh, en uh, engagement within the market, or employee engagement increase, or uh, the last category is you know improving products for your customers. And so, you may have thousands of products, but you're not working on all of them unless you have thousands of teams, which is sometimes impossible. And so focusing on uh, a scope of products per quarter, which I mentioned earlier, could actually help to model products in the way you ought to. So um, abstract those thousands of products into product lines, focus on those instead of individual products when creating your product model. The whole idea is value, is flow of value and value stream. And so, the lessons learned for this category quickly is, number one, you identify the products for your soap organization, identify the products for the real outside users by taking a systems view. You start with only one external product if you need to, so maybe quarterly. And then if you have too many products, lift, list your scope, uh, limit your scope so that you can focus on working on setting products per quarter, and you can develop product lines and help to focus on a product line instead of products and uh, run into managing complexity. And lastly, ensure that all audiences, including roles such as development, operations management, portfolio finance, agree on the products being defined. The next one, this is a, a very critical one. So you identify the products. The next one is creating consistent agile teams and so a lot of organizations are quick to creating their agile teams. However, um, ensuring that the teams are cons persistent and consistent, that is another bigger key. So this will outleave having a persistent and consistent agile team would outleave the current work. So many organizations have agile teams, you know, but a lot of them are project specific, you know, and we all know the definition of what a pro project is. So every time you modify a form of a team, um, for example, in a Jacob, productivity takes a, uh, a dip and before it would eventually rise again. I'm sure a lot of uh, agile coaches here working with team will understand that. So it stands for a reason that, it's, it stands for you to reason that if a company wants to maximize product flow, it should work hard to ensure that the team remains stable for a long time. And you know, for people who are really into coaching here, I get asked a lot of questions. What if somebody isn't good enough? Do I just remove them from a team? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Then the, the first thing you do is never to remove somebody from a team just because they're not performing well, or maybe they have issues. A, a team is as, is as weak as its uh, weakest link. So there are different things, there are different ways of going about that, um, you know, uh, not bringing about changes to a team regardless. And then also, uh, to, to really maximize product flow, there's another thing that comes to mind, which is to address DevOps transformation. And so for, for a real end-to-end, -end, right? We're talking about Agile, we're talking about DevOps. And so if teams own products until the end of the life of that product, then they need to have that DevOps mindset. And remember I, I mentioned that uh, simulation, the DevOps of business. You still have to, to, you can still have your operations and you know dealing with uh, um, different issues, but the team that's created uh, will focus on ensuring that you know the product exists and improvement can continue to exist. And so, uh, product creation or DevOps doesn't start uh, at the end of 
people understanding what agile is, it actually starts with the CEO, with the leadership. That's where DevOps starts. And so um, I use uh, the Azure DevOps a lot. Uh, it's a really cool tool for agile work management and uh, there are different ways of setting up. If there's anyone who is familiar with it here, I'm asking you right now to try the plain view, you would love it. And so I've used other tools in the past, Jira version one. And, um, and so uh, there are different ways you can set up your tool with your team, you know, ensuring there's an alignment of product flow uh, and, and, and um, uh, team um, consistency, working uh, teams organized around the, the product flow. Um, so a client of mine, again, the Excel story, <laughs> they decided to use uh, the uh, ADO, which is Azure DevOps, to manage their work. And they learned that they can actually enter products into um, uh, ADO instead of Excel, and they were delighted. And so when it came to the time where the consistent and persistent teams, uh, um, what they had to do, no one had an idea. So it turned out that all of these teams, they had different managers, they had different people that they were reporting to, and everyone was working pretty much on everything. And the entire idea of a small agile team was lost to them. And so one of the clients understood the value of uh, having a persistent and consistent team that began to refactor the organization and maximize that. So once you identify your products, the next thing you want to focus on is ensuring that you have persistent and consistent agile teams that are organized around the product flow. And so here is um, we move away from having temporary agile teams that could be uh, asked to focus on different products at a time, and you move to persistent and consistent agile teams. As you identify your products, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, identify long-standing agile teams to own them. Keep the team stable, and uh, lastly, ensure that products are owned by long-standing teams on the products. Um, end of life. So there's a lot of benefits that I'm not talking about right now, but uh, in my uh, additional read for you, you will be able to uh, get uh, a whole lot of uh, additional information to back this up. Um, the third step, align with both the finance team, the portfolio management team for value uh, delivery reporting. So a client uh, um, identified uh, let's assume a client has successfully identified the products and now they have everything going for them with the persistent and consistent agile team. A finance team might ask, you know, is there somehow, is there a way to align, you know, with finance, all of this uh, information? How can we align, you know, um, uh, factoring in time and effort? You know, how would we know people are spending money? How can we track this? Is this really, uh, uh, you know, if people are, uh, a lot of issues come around this, you know, their audit issues and all kinds of stuff. And people are going to be finding it hard to track value and spending at the same time. And so on the flip side, portfolio management team, they are struggling with knowing how the epics and the features and the stories uh, uh, are really estimated and costed. And so uh, some of the definitions from the portfolio management is that they would decide on, they're able to decide on the priority of work and when the priority of work would happen. And their skill is understanding value delivery finance and the group is focused on watching the money. So where's the alignment? You know, their skill is in accounting and they understand audits, financial statements and the likes. Now, finance has no idea. So these are the issues. They, they have no idea how epic stories and you know, how uh, the cascading works maybe in your ADO, which is your Azure DevOps, or maybe even Excel, whatever it is. And so maybe an organization is even practicing safe and they're using all kinds of uh, terminologies. And so the portfolio view in the tools did not use the same category in the finance bucket and the portfolio team members didn't have uh, much of the understanding. Of. So you can just imagine this confusion going on and there's no one tool that connected both perspectives. So there are two different perspectives Two different groups of people looking at the same thing. And so the ways that epics and features and stories were, were being written is not good enough to understand the value, which is true. And so um, the client uh, solved this problem by working with finance to understand how the products they had could be identified and aligned with their financial categories. And so these categories 
um, were incorporated into the tool, which is the ADO, and um, which is the uh, Agile tool for working. And they had previously added the products in the ADO, and so the alignment started to happen. So when you add a financial bucket in a higher level, you have to nest it with a product within those buckets. And so we have uh, uh, one column um, highlighting the work, and then we have another column um, matching those financial buckets and categories to those uh, um, buckets of work. So uh, finance team already has commitments towards funding value streams. There's something uh, within SAFE, for those who are familiar with SAFE, that advocates that you can actually decentralize portfolio decisions and you can get to a lean portfolio management. So seeing value for the first time, once uh, one task is finished, for example, suddenly it's clear to people that they were spending money on a particular value and they got that value. And they could just look at the epics and features that are recently closed and they can actually continue to align this. There's so many uh, information radiators. There's a, a link that you're going to be receiving uh, for those who are interested. Uh, uh, it's uh, from, I got it from the Agile Alliance website. A lot of um, um, information radiators, a lot of uh, uh, um, explanation and uh, acronyms could be found um, on that link to help uh, further explain this. And so stories uh, that were too granular for top level reporting, uh, epics that were too, uh, too slow in moving towards the report, SAFE always asks us to uh, work with large teams so that features um, for, for features and the production of machines, for example, you know, in production, uh, maybe in a factory, reporting of the value at the feature level, it's always very easy. Uh, but when you move to a granular level, it becomes uh, a little bit um, difficult. Now, uh, when you write your stories, you know, usually you have your epics and then you start moving into features before you get to your stories. The epic movement um, is still being tracked. And so there's always uh, a critical uh, information here whereby you, everyone on the team will need to understand the risk of uh, not fully understanding what an epic is currently and what it could become. And so teams continue to measure themselves on a story production as they would do, uh, for example, product owners and the product managers. But at this point, there's only one issue left to resolve. The quality of the epics, the features, the stories are not good enough for the reports to be meaningful. So there is a problem. Um, but uh, all of this can be fixed. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you, but uh, let me just show you here. Um, thank you, one second. Just going to the next slide here. And so how this can be fixed quickly is you work with finance to include their bucket in your product uh, architecture, your hierarchy. And you also uh, use your agile work management tools. You align them, as I explained in your ADO, the different columns. I know that uh, some people are familiar with this and maybe some are not. Um, the, um, maybe you've heard of Kanban boards. It's one of the agile practices you can track uh, um, um, reporting of value versus delivery of per product or product line. And lastly, writing epics, features, and stories is uh, critical in, in this model. So um, some of the articles, some of the links that I have uh, made available um, after this, um, my slides will really, really help to uh, navigate the details of, uh, of my presentation. So I would stop here and see if I can take maybe one or two questions. Is there any? If there is any questions, you can just raise your hand or just put it in the chat as well. All right. So if there are no questions, uh, I would like to say thank you very much for listening and uh, uh, 30 minutes, there's no way. I mean, uh, this is a whole workshop, right? 
uh, but I just wanted to just level set the three key points and highlight uh, a few things that I know are really key to pay attention to. And so I just want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for your time.